Senator Babette has submitted a proposal understanding Order 75 today. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? There needs to be at least four senators standing and people are moving, so if they could indicate to me that they support. There's certainly more than four. With the, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the Whips. Senator Babette. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, it's been almost a year, almost a year since the Prime Minister— Excuse me, Senator uh, Babette, can I ask you to move your motion, please? Ah, yes. I move the motion. Thank you. Now, it's been almost a year, like I was saying, almost a year since the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, promised to establish a royal commission into our nation's pandemic response. Almost a year. Where is our royal commission? Now, I know things move slowly in this place, but the Prime Minister promised this in August last year. He said a royal commission or something equivalent would be set up, and I'll quote him here, he said, as soon as practicable. Now, when might as soon as practicable be Prime Minister, how long are we going to have to wait? It's been 18 months now, 18 months since Labor Minister Katie Gallagher backed a royal commission into the pandemic response. Now, Mr. Minister Gallagher told the Sydney Morning Herald last year that she was firmly of the view that a royal commission was the right thing to do. That's what she said. And I agree. Most Australians agree, so where is it? It was also Minister Gallagher who last year said that we need to know, and I'll quote her here, I'll quote, who was advising, what they were advising, whether the government took that advice at critical parts of the pandemic is all unclear because we haven't been given access to that information. And we think the government's response has been characterised by a failure to be prepared, a failure to take responsibility, and then a failure to get it right." End quotes. Now, Minister Gallagher was previously the chair of a COVID-19 committee, which recommended that we have a royal commission. So whilst in opposition, the minister was a supporter of a royal commission, but now it seems like the urgency has evaporated. Why, minister? Why has it evaporated? The Australian people, we need answers. We need answers. We need the power of a royal commission to compel witnesses and, of course, the production of documents. We need the truth, and we need to hold those in power to account. We need to learn from all the mistakes made and never to repeat them. And my God, there were some mistakes made. Now, the World Health Organization declared the pandemic over back in May. Now is as good a time as any to have this commission. Now, the chief health officers, the state premiers, they're retiring, they're walking away, they're exiting their positions. Quick succession, I think. Now, we must not let them get away with what they did during the pandemic, the human rights abuses the weaponisation of fear, the lockdowns, the closing of borders and, obviously, the inhumane vaccine mandates. Unexplained excess mortality is the elephant in the room. Cancer, diabetes, dementia, cardiovascular-related deaths, it's all spiked. Now, I have previously attempted to create a committee to investigate this, but it was voted down by almost every single senator in this place. What a shame that was. Now, we purchased 318 million doses of vaccine at a cost of around $10 billion, and around 68 million doses have been administered. That is approximately 250 million doses wasted, flushed down the drain to the tune of $8 billion. Now, most Australians have caught COVID anyway. The vaccines do not work. We spent hundreds of billions of dollars on the COVID pandemic response measures, and all we have to show for it is out-of-control inflation, excessive government debt, and the guarantee of high taxes for the next generation. 
My home state of Victoria was the most locked down state in the world. Victorians like myself will never forget these inhumane and ineffective measures for the rest of our lives. We'll never forget. Now, we call on the Labor government to honour their promise, honour the promise, establish a royal commission into the pandemic response immediately. You said it should happen. You previously said it should happen. You said it was the right thing to do. You promised it as soon as practicable. Let's give people answers. Establish a royal commission now. Let's make sure that this never happens again. Let's protect our people from gross mismanagement. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Rustin, are you seeking the call? I am. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, there is no doubt that the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in Australia was unprecedented and our response followed a very uniquely Australian path, striving all the time to try and get the balance right between our health and our economic objectives. There's no denying that Australia was one of the best performing countries in the world throughout the pandemic when it came to saving people's lives and their livelihoods. But with the power of hindsight, we do have the opportunity to explore how we could have done things better and certainly how we could do things better in the future if we were faced with a similar challenge again. And I think we all should be open to learning from the experience of the past. If there is another pandemic, we must make sure that the things we did well, we do again, and the things that we perhaps didn't do so well, we don't do again. So it makes sense to review the decision that has uh, decisions that were made um, very quickly and in with a great deal of haste and in the pressure of the immediate situation that we were faced to protect Australians at the time. However, any inquiry must have the appropriate power to take evidence from all levels of government, not just the Commonwealth, given the extraordinary influence and power and involvement of the states and territories in Australia's COVID-19 pandemic response. It must look at all factors that impacted on decisions throughout the pandemic by all people. Because we cannot forget the confronting situation that we were faced with at the time. It was unprecedented and, to be perfectly honest, it was frightening. What, we're seeing back, what we were seeing back in 2020, before a vaccine, was a very different COVID situation than the situation that we see today. Countries like Italy and elsewhere were confronting us with situations reminiscent of wartime. And we sat in National Security Committee meetings confronted by possible situations where Australia may have to set up morgues next to our public hospitals and intensive care units being completely overwhelmed. That was the experience of other countries at the time, and it was something that we were determined in Australia to avoid. It's fair to say that um, such unprecedented circumstances you don't get every decision right. We had to make quick and decisive decisions to protect Australians' lives and livelihoods. But Australia's management of the pandemic allowed us to avoid the death rates that so many other countries had to face. The former coalition government, I believe, acted swiftly during the pandemic to ensure our health systems had the capacity to protect Australians. It's believed that over 40,000 lives were saved by that quick response. Our loss of life from COVID was amongst the lowest in the world, and Australia led the world in COVID-19 ICU survival rates. We ensured that our preparedness early on in the pandemic to increase ICU and ventilator capacity, combined with the latest treatments, medical research and expert advice from the Communicable Diseases Network of Australia and the AHPPC. This helped our frontline healthcare workers, doctors and nurses who worked tirelessly through that time to save the lives of so many Australians. And importantly, our response was always reformed, uh, informed by the best medical advice. We worked tirelessly um, to make sure that this advice was used despite the fact that it was quite scant. We worked with the Australian people to ensure transparency with the modelling and the advice so that we understood the basis of the decisions that we made. We made all um, health experts available to the COVID inquiry whenever they were required to appear and we established National Cabinet in the early days to make sure that frontline communications were had with everybody who was being impacted and had decisions to be made. This was in contrast to the mishandling we saw by so many other countries around the world, where their systems saw chaos as they responded to the pandemic 
and fatality rates that were significantly higher than those that we saw in Australia. Um, but our focus, whilst it was primarily on the health response, we also fo focused on the economic side of the pandemic and uh, we retained our AAA credit rating um, through the support of hundreds of thousands of businesses through, through the JobKeeper support. We also managed to put in place some reforming healthcare initiatives like telehealth, where we now see a telehealth system in Australia um, that is supporting Australians with an innovative approach to how they get their healthcare, which is one of the benefits of being able to work during the pandemic. But we also recognise that older Australians were disproportionately impacted by the <coughs> pandemic, and that's why so much of our focus during the pandemic was to support older Australians, particularly those in residential aged care. So on that basis, we believe there should be an appropriate inquiry that considers all factors into the decision making and looks at all levels of government considering the important Thank role you, played Senator, by the states and territories. Your time has expired. Senator Smith M. <laughs> Marielle. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. From the outset, can I just say it remains the position of the Albanese government that given the enormous dislocation, stress, death and expenditure involved in the COVID-19 pandemic, it would be extraordinary not to have an inquiry into it. No one is walking away from that position that there is a need for an inquiry. We said that before the election. We have said it since and that remains our position. Indeed, it was some three months ago that I stood here in a debate similar to this raised by Senator Roberts in that instance, as opposed to Senator Babbitt, and confirmed that position. But to be clear, we are not yet through the COVID pandemic. It continues. Cases, hospitalisations and deaths related to COVID-19 continue. Maybe at a lower rate, but the pandemic is continuing. And for now, the government is rightly focused on monitoring and responding to cases and ensuring our systems are prepared to respond to future waves. Because we all saw what happened when these waves came throughout the pandemic and we weren't ready. We saw what happened in early education when educators were sent back into the classroom, into the playroom without PPE without any of the protection they needed to keep themselves safe, working with our youngest Australians, little Australians who weren't able to socially distance, who weren't even able to blow their own noses. Our childcare workers went back into that environment unprotected and unprepared and un unheard when they raised those alarms. We saw what happened in aged care. When nurses and carers were exposed to the virus, we saw what happened when it ran rampant through these homes. We saw what happened when the government wasn't prepared with adequate PPE to protect residents and protect workers. And we saw what happened when the government delayed the vaccine rollout. I saw what happened when friends of mine, doctors and nurses, were going into hospitals every day, coming back and telling me they felt like they were going to fight battle on the front line of a war, coming back to their homes and their children, terrified of what they might bring back, but absolutely determined to help and serve their community. Sometimes it's hard to believe that these are things which happened in our lifetime, let alone a few years ago, let alone being part of a pandemic in which we are still living in. And in all these systems, but especially aged care, especially aged care, we saw what happened when systems failed. We saw what happened when the government took their eye off the ball in terms of preparedness. We saw what happened when our essential workers weren't listened to in this environment, and we saw the impact on these facilities, in aged care, in early childhood, in our hospitals and in our skills. And at the risk of opening up a wild can of worms in this chamber during this debate, vaccination remains the single most important step each of us can take to minimise the risk of severe disease and death associated with COVID-19 infection. So of course, the vaccinations, that remains a focus too. Acting Deputy President, the pandemic was a once in a century event from which governments globally must learn a significant amount about how to handle and prepare for such a catastrophic event in the future. That will include the Australian government, as it includes state and territory governments, most of whom are already undertaking their own inquiries into their responses to the pandemic. And these inquiries will provide important information to the Australian government and other levels of government and other actors in such a pandemic, on to how to respond, on how to be prepared and what needs to change. So a review is wholly appropriate. It would be extraordinary not to have one. But the timing of this matters too. 
that timing must be well considered, noting Australia is still experiencing COVID-19. This is not over, and there is heightened risk during the winter months. When you're in the middle of risk, when you're in the middle of managing situations and systems. Acting Deputy President, I want to just take the last 40 seconds I have in this debate to thank and recognise all of those who did fight on the front line of this pandemic, all of those who I am sure are looking forward to review an opportunity to take part in that. Ordinary Australians who went above and beyond every day to protect their fellow Australians. Our nurses, our doctors, our aged care workers and others in the care economy who provided vital care to Australians in the most trying of circumstances. None of us will forget the faces of exhausted nurses and other healthcare workers during this time, but also those who kept the economy moving. Our distribution workers, our shop assistants, our truck drivers, everyone in that part of the economy who ensured that— Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson. Well, I rise to speak in support of Senator Babette's motion. Since before the federal election, it has been One Nation's policy to have a royal commission into the management of the COVID-19 pandemic by Australian governments. The matter has become more urgent following re re revelations of the blatant cover-up over the origins of the pandemic involving scientists, the media and governments. It has become more urgent after revelations the Australian government ordered social media platforms to suppress the free speech of Australian citizens during the pandemic, including myself. At the committee hearing into my legislation to make COVID-19 vaccine mandates and discrimination unlawful, I asked a representative of Moderna what her company might say to Australians who had lost a family member to the vaccine program or who actually um, were affected by adverse side effects. Well, her response was, those people have been indemnified, was the response. I asked representatives of Pfizer if they considered Australians had been forced to get the jabs. They said no. Right. Apparently, these people believe that threatening people's jobs and incomes is not forcing them. Not only were millions of Australians subject to vaccine mandates during the pandemic, many are still excluded from mandates from working in critical sectors today. At a time when the Defence Force desperately needs more personnel, many serving members still cannot be deployed in many circumstances unless they bow to the mandate while people move freely across international borders regardless of their vaccination status. At a time when crime is escalating in the territories, Australian federal police officers are being denied work by mandates while people move freely across state borders regardless of their vaccination status. At a time when public health is in crisis and the aged care sector struggles with staffing levels, experienced nurses are being denied work when people are allowed to move freely into public health and aged care settings regardless of their vaccination status. By keeping these mandates, it appears these agencies are more interested in, in punishing workers who defied them. What the government should be doing is supporting them back into work where they are desperately needed and apologising for the direct attack on their basic human rights. Australian governments have much to answer for. The Prime Minister has promised a Royal Commission into the pandemic but is yet to deliver. Perhaps if we establish something called the COVID-19 voice? He might finally act. And while I've got 22 seconds left, let me apologise to all those people who have been affected by adverse side effects and deaths in their family due to this vaccine mandate that was forced upon them and made to have in order to keep their jobs. That is the truth of the matter, and we have to have a Royal Commission to bring out the truth. Senator Lambie. Acting Deputy President, in May this year, the head of the World Health Organisation warned the world must prepare for the next pandemic, which could be even deadlier than the COVID-19 pandemic. Export experts say it's a case of when, not if. And will Australia be ready? Absolutely not. You've learnt nothing. I sat on that committee. You've learnt nothing. No more manufacturing in place. You don't want to look at our public health system. That was our biggest problem. That's why we went into lockdown because our public health system wasn't up to scratch and, by God, it hasn't got any better. That is where your main problem is, and we've all paid the price for that. It's been disgusting. In January 2022, then Anthony Albanese, 
told the National Press Club it is beyond comprehension this government has refused to learn from this pandemic. Yet here we have a new government. There was a Senate Select Committee which delivered its report in April 2023. There were 19 recommendations. One of those recommendations was to set up a Royal Commission. Now, Australians might think you had a Select Committee. Why spend the money? Because I tell you, Australians, a Royal Commission has the power to compel witnesses and get documents so the government and these committees do not. They do not. Documents that would show how key decisions were made. A Senate Select Committee doesn't have the power to get their hands on the things like Recommendation 18, which was to see the minutes of the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, the AHPPC, the key decision-making body of health emergencies. If we don't know what mistakes we have made or deals that were done or the cover-ups, how are we possibly getting ready for the next one that hits? Seriously, that was your warning, guys. That was your warning, and still your biggest issue you've done nothing about and has deteriorated even more is our public health system in this country. That's what threw us into lockdown. That is what threw us into lockdown, because we didn't have enough nurses out there. We didn't have PPE. My God, and you've learnt nothing. And we're going into uh, the same fight again. Wake up. has expired. Senator Rennick. Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, I too support this motion uh, and believe that we need a Royal Commission into COVID. Uh, I'd also like a Senate inquiry into uh, COVID as well. Uh, but anyway, I'll take whatever I can get at this stage, uh, because there are a number of issues that need to be addressed in this. And first of all is the origins of COVID itself. Uh, we had Anthony Fauci come out uh, the day before Trump's inauguration and said that there would be a, uh, an outbreak, a surprise outbreak throughout Trump's term. Uh, this same person then uh, colluded uh, with none other than some Australians, uh, one Ed Holmes from Sydney University, uh, with the view to actually cover up uh, the origins of the coronavirus. So we need to look at that as well, whether or not coronavirus was deliberately made. Was there a deliberate cover up? Uh, we then need to look at the diagnostic tool, the PCR testing. Uh, we need to determine which part of the COVID sequence was actually used to indicate a positive return. Uh, there's 29,000 proteins in the coronavirus. Uh, 29 proteins, 29,000 nucleotides. We need to know the length of the nucleotides uh, and that sequence uh, to, that was used in the PCR test to determine uh, whether or not COVID was positive. We also need to look at why the cycle threshold was set to 40, not 28. Uh, we also then need to look at why the World Health Organization told uh, national health authorities to code everything uh, that came back with a positive, every death that came back with a positive COVID test to actually COVID and not some other form of disease. So, for example, people could have had comorbidities and were dying from other comorbidities, but the World Health Organization said that you have to actually put that to COVID, uh, which obviously would have bumped up the uh, number of COVID deaths. Uh, we also need to look at the role of the media uh, and, in particular, uh, the way they've ramped up the fear-mongering in, in regards to COVID. We need to look at the censorship that was involved with COVID. Anyone that questioned the narrative of COVID was censored. Uh, that's not the way science is conducted. Uh, science should always be open to scrutiny, so we need to look at the censorship there. We need to look at the role the state premiers played with their daily press conferences. Who can remember the Queensland Premier with her classic statement, there's COVID in the sewerage, be scared everybody. That sort of insanity needs to stop and cannot be allowed to ever happen again. Uh, we need to consider why we bought 300 ma uh, million vaccines, 12 doses for every man, woman and child in this country, when at the same time we were told that uh, two doses were enough. We dropped over $8 billion on these vaccines. We could have spent, bought $75 million, spent $2 billion and saved $6 billion for frontline services, including maternity wards in my hometown of Chinchilla. Uh, we also need to look at uh, why 10 million people caught COVID after the borders were opened up. We were told the public assessment report said COVID was approved, the vaccine was approved to stop infection. Yet 10 million people caught COVID in the year after opening up. It did not work, and we need to ask ourselves why the pharmaceutical Order. companies Your got away with it. Time has expired. Yeah. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, we need a Royal Commission right away because people are still dying and we don't know why. Uh, that's the fundamental reason we should have this inquiry sooner rather than later. We, the, the statistics don't lie. We've, we've got, uh, uh, unfortunately, tragically, uh, deaths in this country running at levels we've never seen before outside of war. Uh, uh, deaths, or so-called excess deaths, uh, the number of deaths above which is expected, given the age structure and 
and um, a history of, of, uh, of fatality in this country is running at, uh, it has been running at 15 per cent and even higher uh, than, than on average. And, and worse, no one can tell us why. Uh, many of uh, myself and other colleagues uh, have asked the Department of Health in Senate estimates, and they don't have any answers uh, for why excess deaths are running at such a, a large number. This is, we're talking of tens of thousands of people here. Uh, dying unexpectedly, and, and no one has answers. Last week, last week, uh, 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 give credit to Senator Hanson and myself and other senators. Uh, we put a bill into the parliament to end vaccine mandates. And last week, as an inquiry into that bill, we had representatives from Pfizer and Moderna, the uh, major vaccine manufacturers which were rolled out here in this country. We had them along to an inquiry, and, and we know now, of course, there are side effects from the vaccine, uh, especially. Uh, heart issues in, in young males in particular, of myocarditis and pericarditis. The most concerning thing I thought of the evidence last week was they don't have any idea why that is happening. They admit now it is happening. They admit that there is, are these side effects from the vaccine. It's happening. Uh, but they don't have any understanding of why it might be happening. And so the question has to be asked here, why is the government still advertising for people to take these products when there is a serious side effect, a heart-related side effect that the government officials, everybody recognises, that's not controversial, and, we, and the manufacturers themselves have no idea why that's happening. They, don't, they can't have a scientific sort of pathway for why their product is causing these particular outcomes. Meanwhile, we also have massive amounts of unexplained excess deaths in this country. So that is the fundamental reason why we should have this inquiry right away. So we try and get to the bottom of what the hell is happening, what has been done, and why, how, what can we make sure to stop people dying? Because I remember it in, during the coronavirus, during the start of the pandemic, it was one death was too many. We had to lock down the country, we had to stop, stop travelling, uh, to stop, stop deaths. And, and I supported the initial response to the pandemic for that reason. Better to be safe than sorry. But now we seem to have gone past all that. And tens of thousands of people are dying in an unexplained way, yet we're not even asking questions about why. Uh, there's a serious disconnect, and you must, must I, think we, I think one of the reasons we're not getting this inquiry is because people, some people are afraid of what the answers might be. Some people that were responsible for the policies uh, of the pandemic might be a little afraid that the answers might embarrass the decisions they made. That is no good reason not to have an inquiry. It's actually more reason. Uh, to have an inquiry so we can make sure we do not make the mistakes again. And finally, one other reason we need to have this inquiry is because it was something that was promised. The Prime Minister promised an inquiry in his National Press Club speech last year, in January last year, before the election. And, and now, almost a year and a half on, or actually it is a year and a half on since that promise, if he's not delivering this, it's another broken promise from the Prime Minister. It's a broke, bro piece of broken trust. And I, I also recognise Senator Gallagher through you, Chair, in the Chamber. Here. Senator Gallagher chaired an inquiry into COVID throughout the last, and she spent her time lambasting the then government. And her, re her major recommendation of that inquiry, guess what it was at the end of her inquiry, was to have a royal commission into COVID. So where is that royal commission, Senator Gallagher? Your Prime Minister promised it. Let's Order. get on with it. Your time has expired. Senator Antic. Thank you, Chair. And I rise uh, too to speak in support of Senator Babbitt's uh, uh, matter of public importance uh, seeking a, a Royal Commission because in 2020 and 2021 anyone who questioned or criticised the lockdowns in this country was called an anti-vaxxer and a threat to public health. But I mean, I've noticed since those days that there are members of the public, um, members of parliament, media commentators, many of them over here by the way, who Senator Rennick did now seek to duck and weave and have forgotten all about that. They've gone rather, rather quiet on the subject. And we want to know what's happened. Well, I'll tell you what's happened. The ha what's happened is the truth has caught up to them. The lockdown narrative has become absolutely indefensible, as has the damage through job losses, uh, through tragic suicides, divorces, increase in health problems. They've all become more evident. And the time will come when every single aspect of the COVID narrative, including the vaccine mandates, the mask mandates, staying 1.5 metres apart, remember that? 1.5 metres apart and so on will become utterly indefensible. It's a matter of urgency. 
It is in a matter of urgency that we examine now why, as Senator Canavan said, Australia's excess death rates are increasing after the pandemic. This is all after everyone got their safe and effective vaccines. Remember, they were safe and effective, but no one wants to ask what's causing the excess death rate. There are more excess deaths occurring at the moment than there were in 2020. The, the ABS has reported that in 2022 there were 190,394 deaths that occurred by 31 December and were registered by 28 February of this year, which is 25,235. That's 15.3 per cent more than the historical average. I'm actually a bit confused as to why this isn't being investigated already. And this particular issue of excess deaths must be the linchpin. If nothing else is, a royal commission must be sought in order to uncover this very issue. In the beginning of 2020, we saw Australia plunge into an illiberal, draconian period of history. I think historians will reflect on this period over the past few years and utterly marvel at how this hysteria was created over a virus that had a 0.16 of a percent fatality rate. They'll write dissertations about how the power of the media propaganda fuelled this. Uh, and about the, uh, how imperative it is we learn from this and that we make sure that this is never, ever repeated. Under the cloak of emergency, legislation was rushed through our parliaments in the most illiberal manners across the country that entrenched the state's pandemic powers, and these also need to be re-examined. So today I stand here in the last 20 seconds to support Senator Babbitt's uh, call for a royal commission to support all of my colleagues that have continued to call for this Royal Commission. It is time the Albanese government put its money where its mouth is and called a Royal Commission so we can get to the bottom of some of this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Senators. This being an urgency motion, it will come to a vote. So I put the question. Those in support of the UAP urgency motion uh, say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
order. Lock the doors. So the question is that uh, the urgency motion is moved by Senator Babette be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes. Order. There being 28 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative.